Okay, I guess we'll start. No, Mortez is not starting. <laughs> uh, all right, so thanks for coming. Uh, we are going to talk about uh, front-end performance, all device, and there's going to be benchmarks and graphs, lots of graphs. Uh, so be ready for that. So first, uh, what do we mean by smartphone? I mean, we need to have some kind of understanding. We agree on, on this definition. So for me, it's, uh, first it's a phone uh, that has Wi-Fi, basically, or any means of getting into the internet. And then the, the camera, speaker, uh, a color screen, and can vibrate. I mean, why not? <laughs> um, so if we think that this is the definition of smartphone, uh, a quick timeline on where do they came from. So in the 90s, you had uh, PDAs, which were meant as uh, yeah, personal assistants. So uh, your uh, calendar, your schedule, everything would be on them. Uh, and then... Straight away. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. <laughs> um, so, 90s, PDAs. End of the 90s, 19s in Japan, uh, because they are smarter than us, uh, they came up with iMode, which, which was a, an evolution of the WAP uh, protocol. Who remembers WAP? Yeah, WAP or whatever you call it. <laughs> Uh, I mode. Anyone heard about that? I mean, it was in 1999, so long time ago. Um, and from then, Japan had internet, so they don't use text message or anything. They just send emails all the time. They can even get the, their emails abroad. So I mean, they have internet abroad and it doesn't cost them anything. Uh, so for our definition of uh, smartphones. The earliest one I could find was this uh, Cyberbank PQ whatever in 2004. That was for the Korean market. Didn't make it to Europe, but starting 2004, we had, well, smartphone existed at least. Uh, then obviously 2007, the first iPhone. Um, so who in the room used iPhones? Yeah, <laughs> bunch of them, bunch of you. Um, then around 2010, everyone saw that uh, touch screen was a great idea, so they got rid of the keyboards on smartphone at least, basically. Uh, and then you know, just a recent date, 2014, uh, very high resolution screens. So I take a screenshot on my phone. I can't open it on my uh, laptop, you know, full size. Crazy. Um, so that's it for the timeline. But what's really interesting is how much people are using smartphones. So right now, currently, there are 2.1 billion smartphones used in the world. In green, that's Android, blue, iOS, and the rest is like uh, Nokia, Blackberries, and whatever, you know, other things. Uh, they're pretty much gone now, just Android and iOS. I guess Windows trying to make a comeback, but we'll see how it goes. Hopefully not well. <laughs> no, that's mean. It's, I mean, they didn't do anything. Uh, and for reference, there are about 7.1 billion humans on the planet. So about 30% of us have access to a smartphone which is huge. Like even in Africa, one in five people have a smartphone. Uh, I mean, it's not a high-end smartphone, but still. Uh, but we'll get to the specs later. And if we take, I only had data uh, starting from 2010. So since 2010 until the end of 2014, 
there's been 3.7 billion phone sold. Uh, so same, green is Android, blue is iOS, and then you have uh, Nokia, BlackBerry, and uh, Windows. Uh, but you've seen before, Nokia and BlackBerry, they disappeared. So what happened? Uh, basically, what happened is that Nokia <laughs> laid off 14, 15,000 people <laughs> in 2013, and from there, they just disappeared. They were bought by Microsoft, which didn't make a comeback then, so me. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, this is like the, uh, the percentage, so it doesn't show the size, but the, just the number of devices increased a huge amount. Uh, like, for example, the Apple, it's pretty much the same size every year, but it's just the Android number that grow a lot. So it's just Android that makes the market increase. <clears throat> so we have this data, and from that we can see how many phones we actually throw away every year. Um, so the, the first one, the two years thing, the lighter shade, uh, it's, it's comparing the, the number of devices sold for 2010 and 2011 compared to the number of phones used in 2011. So what the first two years mean is that just people didn't throw away their phone, it's just that more people kept on buying them and using them. Starting 2013, people started to throw away their phones. Like they, after two years, throw your phone and then buy a new one, an Android one. Uh, so the, the three and four years doesn't really matter, just pretty on the graph. But we can see over the five years, 44% of the smartphone, uh, I mean the number of smartphones that were thrown away correspond to 44% of the smartphone sold overall. So, you know, it's a huge number. So what does it mean for life expectancy of a device? So in months, this is about the average. Yeah, well, that's, so how, how do you know I'm not making that up? So everyone who has an iPhone, which version is it? Is it the 5 version? iPhone 5? Yeah? No? Maybe? So who's going to buy the iPhone 6 before the end of the year? Or, you know, or ask it to uh, Santa or whatever? <laughs> Nobody's going to get the iPhone 6? You already has it? Have, have it? Yeah, yeah, well, so you I mean, 15, uh, 15 months, it's a year and three months. They come out in September, so by the end of the year, everyone's upgraded to the new uh, Apple version. I mean, I don't have to tell you that. You all paid for it. Um, about uh, the people who use Android phones, like who in the last three months you bought a new one or replaced his original version. Yeah, a bunch of you. So it's not crazy. I mean, it, it, it does seem very short, but what you, you have to, to keep in mind is that all the data, it's, you know, it's China that drives the number. They have like uh, four, uh, 400 million uh, devices just in China. And the next biggest market is India, with like 200 million, and then the US. So, I mean, on average, I have four Android No, no, it's it's just if if no. No, if you were a device, if you are a phone, you can expect to be used for three months, and then it, you will be replaced by, you know, someone else. 
But I mean, what I mean is that this is China driving numbers. So it, it doesn't match what we do because we, we buy high-end Android phones that cost huge, crazy amount of money. But they are very cheap Android phones that you can use and do the job, and you can replace them, replace them very easily. And also, many people have more than one smartphone. So, I mean, I have three of them. I even gave one away, so I had four at some point. Uh, that's just the way it is. Uh, so, yeah, after the rest is just, yeah, why not? Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, performance, and we need to make sure we have uh, a limited number of devices we're going to look at to make sure it's relevant for what we want to show. Uh, so the Android phone is going to be replaced in three months. So why is it even you know, a question to look at four years old smartphones? There are a few reasons why it's interesting. The first one is because if you buy a cheap Android phone right now, it's going to be using two years old technology. So, you know, and you're probably going to keep yours like a year or so. So by the time you finish using it, it's going to be a three years old smartphone. Uh, if you have a high-end smartphone uh, with the system updates and the new crazy websites, it's going to become obsolete fairly fast as well. So if you go, if you, if you use a high-end smartphone from three years ago, probably going to struggle with the newer stuff right now. And then the Internet of Things, uh, I'm going to go back to that, but it's related to this, you know, low-spec devices. First device, the Google Nexus S, uh, came out in 2011. Who? Owned one? Yeah. So at the time it was great, right? But if you use it now, it's uh, less great. Uh, so one core, one gigahertz, 500 megs of RAM. Uh, pretty standard uh, spec for the time. Chose it because it's slow and old. To be fair, I used the iPhone 4 to compare it against. You know, same time period. Same spec, even, I mean, a lower CPU speed, but yeah, we'll see, it doesn't really matter. Okay, the, you can see the yellow, that's good. Uh, then the Wiko Sunset 2. So I walked into a store, found the cheapest one, and bought it. Uh, it runs Android, uh, two cores, one gigahertz and 500 megs of RAM. And to compare it to something that we might be using day to day, uh, my current phone, so four cores, two gigahertz per core, and uh, I mean, two gigs of RAM. It's a monster compared to the other device. <coughs> so first, benchmarks. Uh, who knows about uh, SunSpider, Optane, Jetstream, that kind of benchmarks? Yes, some of you. Uh, they're, they're not good indicators of how a device will perform on real websites, but it does give us a good idea of how the hardware performs, and the software as well, that, you know, the Android version, the Chrome version. For those benchmarks, I use Chrome on all the devices, well, except the iPhone, because the Chrome version is the same on all the devices you've seen. That way we can actually compare something that's relevant. Uh, so the Nexus is the first one. It's slow, obviously. The iPhone is doing much better compared to, you know, the spec it has. So, you know, they do something well at Apple. Uh, and you can see that the number of cores is actually going to be reducing linearly pretty much the time uh, for the benchmark. Uh, then you have uh, Dromayo. It's a Mozilla <laughs> benchmark made in 2011 as well. 
Uh, this is a DOM benchmark. They have several tests. So it's going to be adding elements, adding class, attributes, removing them, doing a bunch of DOM manipulation. Uh, so it's probably the G4 is much better than all the rest, probably because Chrome is optimizing that very well and using the four cores appropriately. Because you see it's pretty much one core is, I mean, uh, the G3 is twice as fast as the Wico and twice as fast as the Nexus. And again, the iPhone performs better than the Nexus. Uh, then they have another test doing the same DOM manipulation but with libraries. Uh, this time, the Nexus ran out of memory, so no numbers, but the iPhone can still manage it. And the last one is Octane 2. It's a Chromium benchmark, and the iPhone couldn't handle that either. And here we see that, I mean, Chrome did optimize their stuff because four cores is much better than two cores on it. So I was saying that uh, Android is, uh, well, the Apple is doing much better at JavaScript benchmark that, than Android, and there's a, a reason to it. The first one is Apple controls the hardware, and typically they do better quality CPUs than what's found on Android phones, because Android phones are you know, cheaper, so they have to use less good uh, CPUs. Uh, then you have the garbage collector issue. So on Android, the only thing they can change is the software, so they do a, a lot of work around garbage collection because that's what slows down old phones. Uh, but to do proper garbage collection, you need to have a lot of memory. And, uh, you know, on a 500 meg device, it's, uh, <laughs> it can be dodgy. Uh, so, yeah, on one side, Apple can optimize for their CPU, and on the other, Chrome has to work with what they have. So, basically, that the windows of smartphone, it gets installed everywhere. Uh, Maybe Firefox OS will be the Debian of smartphone, hopefully. <laughs> uh, but we'll see. So I was talking about um, Internet of Things. Uh, later, like a, a day or two ago, uh, Raspberry Pi announced the Pi Zero, which is going to be a one gig, uh, one gigahertz CPU with 500 megs of RAM, you know rings a bell, for $5. And on the Raspberry, you can install Debian and browse the web. So even if you know we have old smartphones, we still have crappy stuff that is going to browse the internet very soon. Uh, who use uh, Raspberry Pi? Yeah, so you have already seen that. So when we talk about the Internet of Things, we talk about the Internet of funny things. It's just, you know, it's weak and slow CPUs and memory that gets on the internet. Because your coffee machine is not going to have a quad core to, to power it, basically. And what's interesting is that the Nexus I bought in 2010 or 11, it was around like 500 euro. The Wico that I bought last week was uh, 50 euro, and Raspberry Pi is 5 euro, well, 5 dollars, so <laughs> you just wait for it, it <laughs> gets cheaper. Uh, so we, we went through the hardware, but we have different browsers on each device. I was using Chrome, but there are like hundreds of other browsers. Uh, first one, Chrome, as we said, then we have Safari for the iPhone. We can't change it, so that's what we have. We're going to look at uh, Opera, because I like it. <laughs> Who likes Opera here? Yes. Go out. <laughs> uh, and also because they have the Opera Mini, so the proxy browser uh, that's supposed to speed up uh, browsing. We'll see how it goes. Uh, UC browser, who knows about this one? 
So most popular browser in China, and we'll see why. Uh, Firefox, because we can. And the default Android browser, <laughs> which is pretty bad. <laughs> Uh, so we have device, browsers, and we need websites. Because as we said, the benchmark were not uh, you know, real-life use case. Uh, and we, we are going to talk about frameworks. So that's where it comes in. First one is readwrite.com, news site. Uh, when I took the picture, they were talking about you know, the specific topic of framework on mobile. I, I didn't make it up. That's... Choose Angular. <laughs> uh, then we have uh, Discourse. So famously, there's been a lot of talk about that because it's really slow on Android. And there's a reason why we'll see that. Uh, then you have The Guardian because it's a newspaper, so kind of the typical stuff you can browse on your, on your phone usually. And it's... Uh, optimized for mobile. It's just not, yeah, let's do a single page app, whatever. Uh, same with Facebook. It's actually, you know, real mobile websites that are designed to work on mobile. And that makes a big difference. Uh, so we're going to look at the data now. <laughs> First one, frameworks. Uh, so it's going to be the startup time. So you assume you have all the stuff loaded on your browser, and you just want to initialize the library, the framework. So Angular. It's, uh, I mean, it could be worse, but it's not great, especially on your old Nexus phone. And you can see that the iPhone from, you know, uh, four years ago is beating my quad core. Yeah, well... The <laughs> Why not? Uh, so yeah, Apple did really do well on their uh, JavaScript machine. React, it's not very reactive <laughs> on mobile. <laughs> the whole point of the session, you can work out now. <laughs> uh, same again, the iPhone beating everyone. Uh, if you add more cores, it helps, but not as much as a good CPU, apparently. Um, then you have jQuery. So I don't know why, but the iPhone stuff, it didn't, didn't know. Yeah, it's too fast. No. <laughs> no it, it, yeah, it's built in now. It's, uh, no, it, it just failed, and I didn't have time to fix it. But I mean, it's going to beat everyone else. So why bother? Uh, <laughs> but you can see that uh, it's still slow. Even on a phone I bought last week, so the, the green line, it's, yeah, it's like uh, 300 milliseconds. I don't... Yeah, yeah 200. 200, almost. So <laughs> still slow. Um, and the last one, uh, who heard about Elm, the language? No? So it's like... Uh, a different language that compiles down to JavaScript. Uh, there's been a few blog posts about it on the Drupal planet. Uh, I wanted to see how, it, how it's doing on mobile, and it's doing really well. And basically because they don't load everything at once. <laughs> so they're smart about what they load. And there's probably some, you know, uh, the ways they initialize their stuff that's, you know, not crazy expensive, like React, for example. Um, so that's all fine, but what we really want is how long does a website take to load on a note phone? So read write, it's uh, 1.4 meg, uh, the size of it, which is fairly standard. 54 requests, fairly standard as well, and 250 uh, kilobytes of GS, which is, you know, average. The problem is. It's bad JavaScript, which means that when you browse the website, you wait for 20 seconds or no, 15, um, you know, 15 seconds on the Nexus for anything to show up. And they're really smart about how they load it because the, um, like the DOM complete event is going to be complete after like 
four seconds, but then there's 10 seconds of the browser just you know doing stuff. Yeah. So probably because of the Google, you know, looking at the downloaded time performance, everything. So they just cheat, and it sucks. <laughs> Uh, the iPhone is not doing very well either. Uh, the Wiko, the, the cheap phone, same thing. Only because you have lots of core that you can execute lots of JavaScript at once. Uh, that's help, but then again, it's like six seconds for the website to load. I'm not waiting six seconds to, to read crappy articles, <laughs> basically. Uh, then the Ember website. This is really interesting because if you look just at the specs until the size of the JavaScript is great. I mean, less than one meg, uh, 25 requests, but then there are like 600 kilobytes of JavaScript. I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> it's stupid. There's no way around it. And you pay the price on the Nexus because it takes a huge amount of time to, to load. Uh, Interestingly enough, the iPhone is pretty good at loading that stuff. Uh, it's doing better than the cheap phone I bought last week. Uh, but you know, then again, it's not great time. So what does it look like when you have a proper optimized mobile website? Well, you can see someone had a five second performance budget on page load. <laughs> Because on new phones, it loads under five seconds, basically. The, though the weird thing with the iPhone, it's just a custom font. It took a while to download and render the page. No idea why, but it's consistent. So, But then you, you can still use the website uh, before it's loaded. So, yeah. And it's doing well on the old Nexus phone as well. Facebook, even faster. Uh, so I was on my home connection, so the latency probably doesn't uh, comes into it much. Uh, yeah, and it's even fast, less than five seconds on my Nexus phone, which is pretty amazing, <laughs> considering the, the crappy spec it has right now. So, I mean, if you say, I'm going to do a single page app because it's great on mobile, that's not true. I mean, performance, it's not just by accident that you have under five second load time. They did that because they inlined a bunch of CSS, a bunch of JavaScript, and they have the main content you know, in the first request that you make. And that way, they can deliver the website very fast. And I mean, I was on a stable connection, so I tried to do a screenshot of the read-write website on the hotel wireless here. It took me five minutes to even load the thing. <laughs> so, yeah, well. Um, so even if you, I mean, if, if your justification for doing a single page app is mobile performance, that's not the right you know, argument to make. You should find something else because you like it or because it's fancy or something else, but not performance. Remember, website don't kill the battery. It's lazy developers. <laughs> but this is, you know, with Chrome, there's hundreds of browsers. So what does it look like if you add more browsers to it? Uh, and proxy browsers. So who knows about the concept of proxy browsers, how they work and what they do? Yeah, a few of you. So basically, you don't make the request directly. You ask Google, Opera, UC to do the request for you. They will do it and send you back an optimized version of it. So it depends. So you could have like a crappy image because they take less size. Uh, they can execute some JavaScript for you as well to speed up the rendering on your side. They can do a bunch of things. And also, because you connect with their server, you can use optimized protocols to deliver the content. I mean, this is Google, but 
It's the same thing for the UC browser and Opera. OK, so read-write. Um, the, first, the first browser is going to be Chrome, just for you to, to be able to compare to the rest of them. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's only Safari for the iPhone, but you can't do anything about it. <laughs> so what's important to, to see here, uh, oh yeah, the Opera Mini. So Opera Mini does a lot of optimization on the server side which means that the whole JavaScript front-end of read-write is useless because you browse to it, it asks you to download the JavaScript file. Yay! <laughs> uh, so pretty bad mobile strategy on their side. Uh, so yeah, a slow website is going to be slow no matter what browser you're using. That's basically the takeaway here. And Firefox, surprisingly fast. Hmm. But uh, yeah, it's just for this website. The rest is not like that. Uh, and you can see that the UC browser, the proxy version of the UC browser, does save some time on low-powered devices because on the G3 it's useless. Then if we go with Discourse, uh, on this one, Opera Mini just... I don't know what it does, but it does it really well. That means that on a, on a node device, you get the same experience as a newer device, which is great. Uh, then you have the Guardian. And here you see that the fast website is going to be fast, no matter what. Uh, except on the Nexus, with Chrome data saving thing going on. Uh, I believe it's because the Nexus has one core and the data saving thing with Chrome, you know, uses several cores when it can. So it makes sense it's slower on the Nexus than, uh, than the rest. And again, UC browser, really well suited for that. Uh, so if you have a crappy phone, use UC browser, basically, like the Chinese do. <laughs> well, these are the Chinese, the US, it's not going to be Europe, so yeah. pick your side. <laughs> and then Facebook, uh, same thing, UC browser, very fast. And what's interesting is that the browser has built in optimization for a few sites, so Twitter, Facebook, and on the Nexus, I was able to load uh, this fa the Facebook page in 1.6 seconds, which is uh, even faster than the G3 stats. Actually, it's, yeah, I wrote G4, but I, you know, pretend it's G3. So this is, yeah, no more graphs, all right? <laughs> uh, but what you need to remember, uh, we need to look at China, how they do it, because they do it better, <laughs> basically. Uh, they are bigger, they have uh, more people, more users, more things going on, uh, and we can learn a lot from what they do. I mean, look at, I mean, it's not China, but Asia in general. Japan had proper internet on their mobile phone in 1999, so they were laughing when the iPhone came out, like, hey, hey. <laughs> um, Proxy browsers are very important because lots of people use crappy phones and we need to make sure Drupal is usable on proxy browsers, which is not totally the case now. Like Opera Mini is not going to let you administrate your website properly. Uh, I mean, it's because we use more JavaScript than before and it's not, yeah, well, we, we don't do the right thing for, for it to work on proxy browsers properly. Uh, but we should improve that. And it's going to be an internet of weak things. So all this decoupled stuff, just keep in mind, it's not going to be a quad-core CPU with two gigs of RAM. And even that by now is you know, not that great anymore. They are like uh, phones with eight cores, and whatever. And why stop? <laughs> 
So the takeaway here, if you want to be able to look at your website from your ARM phone or whatever phone comes out, uh, don't use Angular, React, or Ember. Just, well, or if you use it, make sure you use it properly and just the part you need and load only that if you can. And if you can't, well, it's a framework's fault that it's not possible to split it up. Uh, just side note about front-end rendering. It's only a good idea when, you know, you're the one into it, but from the outside, it's pretty stupid and slow. <laughs> I mean, probably there are, use, there are use cases that are uh, relevant and fitting, but I don't see them often. Um, and maybe some publicity before leaving. Uh, the whole point of framework is to organize the code, not to make things slow. I mean, it's not, they're not designed to make things slow. They're designed to make the developer experience better, which means that if you standardize on a framework, you should be able to optimize the way this framework is working for your use case. Um, so jQuery has the ability to uh, compile a smaller version of itself, uh, excluding the module you don't use. So who knows about the custom jQuery build? Yeah, a few of you. All right. Uh, so what? Uh, so it's a tool I wrote. It's not, you know, great, stable or anything, but it does some of the job. Uh, it it looks at uh, jQuery API. Uh, look at which function are, are in which modules. Then look at your code and see which function of jQuery you're using and make a list of all the modules you actually need for your code to, to run. That way, you, know, you can just load the jQuery you need. Uh, I'm, I have a few things going on as well. Uh, we should be able to dynamically generate the jQuery version. So you, you have dependencies in, uh, in Drupal 8 now. And we should be able to have dependency on jQuery modules uh, to be able to build the jQuery version suited for the page you run. Uh, so in the in the benchmarks, I did a custom jQuery version with you know you remove the effects, sizzle, and all that crap. Uh, it loads much faster. I didn't have the place to put it, but it does help to remove stuff from jQuery. Any questions? Too hungry for questions, maybe. Yeah. How about pre rendering? Like when we when we have fights like this in company, uh, the React guy will tell me that React will pre render nicely. <coughs> so it's not an issue. Like you won't be waiting for So you mean pre rendering on the server and sending the HTML? Yeah. So that would be the way to go, yeah. I mean if you want to use a very heavy framework, uh, go that way because then you can put a huge machine that renders it very fast and you don't cost any it doesn't cost anything for the user but we don't talk about that enough but uh, people don't talk about this kind of use case enough when they mention frameworks and node.js and all that stuff questions Yeah, so yeah, single page apps where you don't have the cost of loading on each page. But uh, if you remember, we have the initialization that still takes a lot of time. So are you fine with your user staring at a blank screen for 20 seconds? It's, I mean, it's a decision to make. But I, I'm, I'm arguing that it's never a good one. <laughs> No, I haven't looked at that. Uh, but the thing is that your memory constraints. 
So if your, you know, if your uh, framework is heavy, you're going to run into uh, garbage collection issues, uh, which is probably why the React stuff is so slow on the Nexus. Uh, I don't know. That would be good to look into. Didn't have time. Yeah. Uh, no, so I'm not an uh, iPhone user, so I don't know how that goes. I, I, I mean, I know the JavaScript engine on this is uh, you know, less good than the Safari browser, but I don't know how much it's, how bad is it. But what's interesting with the Facebook stuff, like this whole Facebook instant article thing, it's basically the iMode from 1999. Because iMode was a subset of HTML, that would render fast on, you know, feature phone. <laughs> and now we have yeah, instant article, pretty much the same. All right, yeah. Well, we... Well, it's hard to find similar sites. Well, I, I look into it, but the problem is that it's not a real site and not a real app. And uh, so there were a couple of articles about people arguing on the, you know, the relevance of framework on mobile. And one of the, the first articles was using to do MVC to do its benchmarks. And they were like, well, yeah, it's, it's great, but nobody uses to do MVC. Well, I mean, it's a, it's like an absolute comparison. Like you as a user, are you comfortable waiting 20 seconds for the page to load? I mean, that that's the question uh, that I'm asking with those benchmarks. It's not if Angular is faster than Ember. I mean, so I'm saying both are very slow, so don't use them for mobile. <laughs> But you no, know, no. I mean, I agree. We it would be great to find similar website with similar features, but yeah, it's difficult because nobody wants to pay twice for the same thing. All right. Well, thanks again, and uh, have a good lunch. <laughs>